you go. Okay, guys. Thank you for being here to our uh, designs and simulation breakout session. Uh, my name is Santanya Das. I'm the uh, vice president of the Design Simulation Information Modeling Group. And with me, I have some industry mavens. Ken Adamson, who's in charge of our building electrical and plant uh, divisions that we have, and Bob Mankowski, who is in charge of our civil, geospatial, and our microstation information modeling platform uh, division. So with the three of us, we are going to try to take the information that you were deluged with about an hour ago from Greg and Bupinder and try to apply it to a practical use case study so you can see how integrated projects and information mobility and intelligent infrastructure can actually play out in the, in the real world. And we're going to mix it with some future technologies as well, right? So you can see on some of the ideas that Bentley is building on and how that can apply and, and sort of help uh, the workflow processes that today uh, may sound a bit uh, dis it, right? So first things first, on your desk, and of course uh, with my luck this thing won't work, uh -huh. so you have a piece of paper um, that should have a username, a URL, a username, and a password uh, on each one of your guys' seat. If you have a iPad, iPhone, Android, laptop, whatever it may be, go ahead and log into that particular uh, site now. If you don't have an iPad and would like one, I have one here uh, that we can pass out, not for you, Ken. So if anybody needs one over here, um, you can go ahead. I think this one might be logged in already. Um, and go ahead and log in on that, and you know, and uh, don't really do anything yet. I mean, you can, but you know, it would kind of defeat the purpose. And so uh, we're going to use this in a live, interactive demonstration to show some of our simulation services and how our cloud services work. So you saw this slide before, you saw Greg pointed out, everything is a campus, right? So today we're going to look at how we're going to construct, how we're going to build and design um, a hospital building. And that was the hospital building that you saw Harry pull up in the iPad there. Um, he was kind of navigating through it. And you saw it had a lot of different things going on, electrical, mechanical. It had, um, of course, the structural part. It had civil underneath it. Um, but before you even get to that, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on before you get to the asset itself. First, you've got to figure out where the site's going to be, um, and you've got to figure out what kind of grading you're going to need, how much cut and fill, what is the type of soil, uh, what kind of bearing is going to happen. You can see that there's an adjacent freeway there. You might have to adjust that. You might have to put a, uh, an on-ramp or an exit ramp on there. You might have to put in a new flyover as well for access to the bridge or access to the, um, to the hospital. And then you've got the actual infrastructure of the hospital itself, right? So. When you talk about uh, information modeling, that's why we don't like to use the word B in terms of the building information modeling, because the building is a part of it, and obviously the biggest part, it's the asset that you're interested in, but there's a lot of other things that are going on uh, before that that you must really uh, sort of uh, bring into the, into the whole picture. So people, when they talk about the building information modeling, you'll notice this was a survey that was done uh, last year, uh, they'll notice that uh, people haven't been all that happy. They're using it. There's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of technologies out there. But the problem people have when you ask, when you dig, dig really deep down into what is the problem with your information model? Is it the training? Is it the software itself? Is it interoperability between the software products? Or is it the ability to share? What do you guys think is the number one problem that all of these respondents, over 300 engineers, architects, and owners have mentioned? Which one of the four? Number four, and then somebody said number one. Actually, 75% said it was number three. It was the interoperability. It was very, very hard to exchange data uh, with each. Now, all of these other, of course, had high percentage answers as well, right? It depends on some of the workflows. Some people have figured it out, some people haven't. But the interoperability between these software products have always been a problem. So a lot of people come to me and say, it's actually BIM is a big interoperability mess. Uh, is what we have right now, a compound of tools and things and really nowhere to share. So how are we trying to address this problem? Now, every one of these disciplines has a way to do interoperability exchange. And you heard that from uh, Bupinder. We embrace design standards, whether it's the IFC from building uh, and uh, uh, the architects, or if it's GBXML for the energy, if it's ISO 15926 for the plan. The problem is, how do you decipher all of these schemas? How does one schema talk to another schema? How does one format or industry standard talk to another? And what Bentley tried to do to sort of uh, 
discretize this problem is we said, let's break this down into these common elements. Let's say that if you want to talk about a building's footprint, then let's talk about a building footprint in a way that an electrical engineer, a structural engineer, or a plant guy may be able to understand, right? And of course, if a building guy wants to talk to a building guy, then there's going to be industry standard formats that allow a much more detailed way of communication. But going across these disciplines, uh, you need something obviously a little bit more holistic. And that's where we introduced the concept called project-wise cross-discipline coordination services, which we're going to kind of uh, call DCS for the rest of our presentation uh, today. But these are some uh, cloud-based uh, services that we have, as well as desktop-based services that allow for this information and mobility to cross, uh, to cross disciplines. So I'm going to hand over the first particular part of our uh, journey to first investigate what's going on underneath the building before we actually get to the building. And I'm going to hand this over to Bob Mankowski. Bob. Thank you. OK, so um, where, do you, where are we going to begin to build our information model? Right? We're going to build it from the ground up. And, um, and what we're actually going to do is start underneath the ground. And we're going to start looking at the, uh, the, the subsurface layers of Earth and um, because the, the geotechnical engineer is going to provide information to the other engineers so that they can make their decisions. So through different uh, geotechnical observations, boreholes, things like that, they're going to gather a lot of information about what's happening underneath the earth so they can determine whether they need uh, different types of piles or what types of foundations and footings, whether there's any unsuitable material that needs to be excavated, whether they need some special considerations for settlement, and that kind of thing. So what we have uh, is a product called Gint, which allows you to allows our users to manage an information model about subsurface data, and so it, it allows them to uh, quickly uh, gather all the data into a, a database, uh, including not only the soil properties and things like that, but also the lab results uh, of the soil, and then report on that in a very efficient way. And this is the way uh, a site information model is going to begin with the subsurface data, uh, but it also will happen throughout the project. It's, it'll be a continuous process, and this subsurface information and borehole logs and things like that actually become part of the information model. model and the asset. And so uh, that's what GINT does for us in this context. And then we're going to move above the ground and we're going to start trying to model the existing site. We need to get an understanding of the surface of the earth, but also the existing infrastructure that might be there, right? And trying to create a model from existing grading plans or site plans is often very tedious and difficult. It's time consuming. And oftentimes the site plans and grading plans that you have haven't been kept up to date. So the infrastructure that's been built doesn't uh, really uh, look like the infrastructure that you see on the plans today. And so it's difficult to build an accurate model without really a lot of details. And so today you heard a bit about this already, but laser scanning and point cloud technology is becoming a de facto way of, of gathering a lot of information, highly accurate information, very quickly, and then using that as a model of the existing site. Now those point cloud data sets can be quite large and unmanageable unless you have special software like our project-wise point cloud services to help the user manage that. But um, you probably heard it mentioned this morning that we've made uh, point clouds a fundamental data type uh, of our platform. And so what that means is it, it brings point cloud technology to virtually all of our applications, whether it's MicroStation or InRoads, OpenPlant, or Bentley Map, they all have the ability to work with point clouds as a native uh, format. And so what you see here is just a very simple example of how uh, the tools in MicroStation uh, are recognize the point cloud and you can snap, for example, uh, using the native tools that engineers are already familiar with to create geometry, but using a point cloud as a reference. And then there's different types of display styles here. We call it thematic shading. And in this case, what we're doing is looking at the colors representing the elevation of the points. Remember, a point cloud is a 3D model. 
And so here's a big site and you can see there's lots of, uh, lots of points, but perhaps your site is only a subset of that. So you can use again the native clipping and, and things like that in MicroStation to just uh, filter down to the points that you need. Uh, we also mentioned this morning about our, our project-wise point cloud services. Uh, because these data sets can be very large and, un and difficult to manage, and, and Bupinder gave the example of, of using FedEx to send a portable hard drive you know, from the office to the field, and when it arrived, uh, the hard drive had failed, and so they had to do it again. Uh, we're trying to solve that problem through the project-wise family of servers so that you can manage your point cloud data on your server and then stream the point cloud down to the field users or to other offices. And that way they get the data they need very efficiently. Uh, they get it on demand. In other words, we're not transmitting the whole point cloud and you have to wait for a four gigabyte download before you begin work. You reference that point cloud, the, the data starts to stream in and the user can get right to work and start to visualize the site. And that's really, really uh, uh, very helpful. All right, so I said that when we do a point cloud, when we scan the site with light, LIDAR, say an aerial LIDAR, we're not only picking up points from the surface of the earth, but we're also picking up points of vegetation and buildings, roads, bridges, all the other infrastructure that's there. So how do you create what we call a bare earth model? How do you find out what is the, the surface of the earth here. Well, we have tools that can do that, right? So you can filter down the point cloud only to those points that are classified as ground and then use those points to create your, your terrain model. This way you get a nice surface of your terrain model. You could also uh, combine that information from the, from the point cloud with traditional survey information. So if you've gone out with total stations and other things to get, say, more detail and, and, and higher accuracy in some areas, you can combine that with the surface that you created from the point cloud. So it's not an all or nothing kind of approach. You can, you can bring different things together. Uh, so let's go back underground for a moment. We talked about the infrastructure above ground, but of course in, in most projects today you're dealing with a brownfield site. Right? It's not green fields. There's already existing infrastructure there and there's buried infrastructure. Subsurface utilities prevent, uh, present a lot of challenges to projects today. There's a high potential for conflicts between the existing utilities and say new utilities or foundations and footings and things that you want to put in, especially when we're dealing today with a lot of very limited and narrow right of ways. So they're very congested with a lot of utilities as you can see in these photos. Construction projects are, are having uh, increasingly tight schedules. So any mishap, any unexpected event, like a, a bucket of a backhoe going through a gas line, you know, creates real schedule pressure and, and cost pressure, but uh, of course not to mention the, the health and safety aspects of that, right? So getting a, an understanding of your subsurface utility mo uh, uh, information model is very important to projects. So. We're working on, this is one of the things uh, Santanu said, you know, we're combining this with some future information. This isn't released yet, but open road subsurface utilities is something we've been working on for a while that provides a feature data set for gathering all this information about subsurface utilities. And this information may come from existing as-built records and things like that, but that would sort of be a low quality of information because, you know, the records might not reflect what actually was was happening down there. And it might go all the way up to where you've used, uh, say, a vacuum excavator to, to uncover the utility and get a real precise location on where that utility is. And that would be a real high quality of information. And so we have this built into the data model so that the user not only understands the information they have in terms of where the position of the utilities are, but also what quality of information they have. Is that utility really where it says it? Well, we only know from the existing plans that we think it's there. Or, hey, we know it's right here because we surveyed it, we uncovered it, and we know it's there. So once we do that, we have all sorts of tools for bringing that information in from GIS and things like that to create a 3D solids model of the underground utilities. And then once we have that, we can create a, what we call a utility conflict, conflict matrix, which allows us to see, hey, are there conflicts between the existing utilities and what I plan to do? New utilities, new stormwater, new sewer uh, building footprints and things like that. 
So uh, one other aspect of this is that when we're building new sites, we're often building new drainage capabilities, right? We're going to put in parking lots, we're going to put in buildings and all this, and we have to figure out all the new drainage capabilities there. So we integrate that hydrologic and hydraulic analysis right into this 3D model as well. So it really fuses the analytical and physical modeling of subsurface utilities. And then finally, I'll just also mention that it does create plans, profiles, and section drawings as well, right? Because we still deliver a lot of drawings, and Santana will talk more about that later. Once we have our uh, site understood, we understand our underground utilities, we're going to start designing some new roads, access roads into the hospital. So we have Open Roads Roadway Designer, which is uh, enables engineers to create a complete and unified geometric model, so combining 2D, 3D, surface and solid models all into one information model. Uh, what we say is it contains the design intent. What that means is that the software remembers why an engineer chose to, to design something a certain way. That way when they make a change somewhere, it can update the model very intelligently. Right? If it didn't know why that curve was constructed with a, a hundred meter radius, when I update something, it might not know to keep it at 100 meters. It might change the radius, and the engineer didn't intend that, right? So that's what we mean about keeping the design intent, is understanding how the engineer designed something and making sure that that is maintained when the model is changed. And again, finally, we, of course, can create plan and profile cross-section views as well as the 3D views. Once you have all that, you can create some really compelling animations and, and visualizations of your new site. In this case, we're looking at the highways near the hospital, maybe looking at the exit ramp. All this content, you see the, the cars, the trees, and the vegetation and all that, that's provided uh, as part of our microstation visualization feature. And, uh, and the animation is pretty simple, it's set up, it's a workflow oriented thing. So uh, again, it's a nice way to uh, get public acceptance and public buy-in uh, on your projects is to provide really nice animations and, and simulations like this. And then finally, uh, when the civil engineer is done with the road design and things, one of the things they're going to do is hand it off to, in this case, a bridge engineer. right? So we're coming back to our cross-discipline coordination services here, where now that I'm the civil engineer, let's say, that's designed the roads, and I've set the alignment for the bridge, I can now use these coordination services to communicate that to the bridge engineer, right? So that I say, hey, here's where the bridge needs to go, now go design your structure. Here's the, here's the terrain model, here's the super elevation on that curve of that bridge. Let me communicate all that in a structured way using the coordination services so that the bridge engineer can go ahead and design the structure. So Centennial? Thanks, Bob. So, key point, cross-discipline coordination services, right? That is the way the road engineer is going to talk to the bridge engineer. That's the way the geotechnical engineer is going to talk to the road engineer. That's the way site engineer is going to talk to somebody else. Using this particular service, it allows us, again, to transfer information across disciplines uh, with the subtext that we're only going to give the information that you're probably going to be interested in, right? Uh, you know, for example, a bridge engineer doesn't care about the details of the road, the asphalt quantity, and so forth, things like that. He wants to know the horizontal alignment, vertical alignment, profile, and so forth there. So, again, one of the other key themes that Bob had mentioned, we have not left our information modeling environment once yet. All that information was harmonized using through iModels or leveraging the platform which we call MicroStation. So as you see many of our competitors and other vendors, you've got to go to this product to do visualization, this product to do animation, this product to do your actual design. We haven't left anyone. And here's another proof in point. Once I use design coordination services, I'm going to use our PowerBridge modeler product that we're going to release in the early part of 2013 to be able to design all the bents, the beams, the decks, the columns, the piers. Uh, you know, in this case, we have a hammerhead foundation with some pile caps going underneath in there. And we're going to design all of this stuff with the information that the road engineer gave. So therefore, if the alignment changes, my bridge is going to change. 
Well, what do I want to do after that? Well, obviously, I got to analyze the thing, right? I can simulate the traffic patterns that are on there, and I can use those as loads. And then I can ask my RM bridge product or the other uh, bridge products that we have at Bentley, like Leap, to tell me, well, is this particular deck going to be safe enough? How much thickness concrete do I actually need? You know, is it going to pass all the AASHTO design code checks such that I can actually uh, uh, manufacture this particular bridge? And again, all linked in with design coordination services. But another great part of DCS is the fact that you can bring the detailer much earlier on in the process. And this really, really is a beneficial tool because he wants to be able to start manufacturing and fabricating steel or rebar. He wants to be able to start figuring out his shipping plans, how he's going to gather this stuff together, start tagging the rebar, send it out to the field, right? He wants to start creating work packages for, for construction crews. But how are you going to do that if the design's not done or if it's always changing, right? Well, he can use, again, the coordination services to get that information and start doing some preliminary detailing using our pro structures uh, package. Our pro structures package, again, is based on the same information modeling environment. Uh, which is our microstation environment. And doing that, we can now start actually creating bar bending schedules, bill of materials, fabrication drawings, and start communicating with our uh, suppliers to be able to start uh, uh, getting this material ready to ship to site. Now, what Bupinder and Greg were talking about in terms of information mobility is that at some step, you want to take this information and go to the field and maybe make a decision based upon it. Because all of our uh, information is all based on the I-model currency, even design coordination services expects an I-model currency underneath, it's very easy to be able to put these things on platforms like the iPad or you know, the, the Google Android or whatever it may be. And we're going to show you some examples of that as we go. So Bob was kind enough to do the site planning for us using our GINT and our information model. He then added in the road. We designed the bridge. And finally, we can get to the building itself. So you can see an information model isn't just about the B. It's not just about the building, right? It's about the building in terms of a verb. There's a lot of stuff that goes behind it, and that information is critical for you to make the right decisions. So how do we actually get the building going? Well, you got to take advantage of geocoordination, mapping. Uh, you want to be able to start thinking downstream. How am I going to hand this over? Who's going to manage my asset there? And the last thing you want to do is repurpose this data together, right? So how do you go all the way from space planning or program management or facility programming all the way down to managing the asset in, let's say, EB, right? How do you get that data to be able to repurpose itself? Well, that's why we launched Ecosim Building Designer this year. Again, based on the same information model as the mapping stuff or the road insight stuff or the geotechnical stuff there. And because it has the ability to take advantage of all that information there, Building Designer is going to handle all the design and analytics uh, from an architecture to a mechanical to an electrical or even to, a, uh, to an HVAC or energy uh, simulator, right? So let's just focus on that part of the segment, let's, on that part of the workflow, right? The actual design and analysis. First thing Ecosim Building Designer can do for this hospital is create massing models for you, right? You can, you can uh, play around with your spaces. You can play around with your plans. We just introduced re recently a great partnership with a company called Trelligence that can allow us to do some space planning, and that information can be brought straight into Building Designer to start producing a massing model. Then as you can see in these AVIs, you can geolocate this information onto Google Earth. So you can take that masking model, put it on a site, a prospective site, and say, well, let's see what kind of characteristics or uh, adjacency problems I may have. You can also send this out as an iModel, as a PDF. So you can share this information with others who may not have Bentley applications to take a look at it, right? So very, very portable, right? Information mobility, right? Extremely important. Now, what you have is you have that physical model. You have a nice big massing model there, and the architects produced it. And because I'm an engineer, I'm allowed to make fun of architects, right? So they're going to give you something. Sorry, Andy. They're going to make something that's going to say, well, can this thing actually stand up? Can this thing actually hold the, the, the uh, what kind of HVAC systems are going to need? What kind of lighting systems are you going to need there? So 
You know, the, the problem is, is that all that information, even though it may be housed in an information model, needs to be extracted, right? So using our information model, we can share this stuff through 3D printing. You know, if you had a 3D laser scan printer there, or it's a nice way to evaluate what you have externally on the facade there. But now what we want to do is be able to break down the details of this particular model. So the first thing we want to analyze when we get in the analytics is the site. Bob was, again, very good in terms of determining what type of site we would need and the soil there. So we can use our civil analytics based on our information modeling platform to evaluate different site conditions, right? We can say cut and fill. How much cut and fill is going to happen if I rotate my building by 5 degrees or if I rotate it by 30 degrees there? Now that I have the soil information there, I know that, well, it may cost me more to be able to dig this stuff out because it might be clay here versus sandy silt or something like that. The structural engineer is going to say, okay, well, let's use design coordination services or cross-discipline coordination services to, to extract me structural information. So he uses that service to get the structural model out here. He dumps that structural model right into STAD using the coordination services, and he analyzes the steel and concrete, tells him if he needs bigger beams, bigger columns, how thick his slab is supposed to be, how much rebar he needs, everything a structural engineer needs to do. But the beautiful part about it is that all the information that he's producing, everything from resizing the beams to analyzing the types of footings that he may need, all that information goes back to the physical model. And how does it do that? Again, using our cross-discipline coordination services. So here, you'll notice we designed the foundations. And everything in green is new. That stuff that wasn't part of the physical model. You know, the, whoever was the owner didn't decide to model the footings. He didn't care or he didn't know. So the structural engineer did all that stuff, and you can see all that new uh, rebar in there. And with the coordination services here, we track what's been added, what's been rejected, who made the change, when the change was made, rolling back, and so forth, right? So all that stuff is now managed there, and uh, it goes back to Ecosim Building Designer, right? Again, the choice of, uh, of the tool that the particular architect or owner of the building wants to use. Structural engineer uses his own tools again. And now production plans, framing plans, and straight uh, general arrangement drawings are being automatically produced from building designer with the new updated information from the structural engineer. Now what about the electrical, right? Well, again, using Ecosim Building Designer and the same uh, interface, uh, we've uh, added to our uh, electrical portfolio by acquiring Elko Systems uh, this year. And that allows us now to do things like raceway and cable tray management. Or, as you can see in this particular case, we can model lights, circuits, panels, uh, and so forth in this hospital model, right? And what's really great about all of this information is, again, it's the same environment. It's the Ecosim building designer environment, except the electrical engineer is going to access the tools that he's interested in, right? And because uh, Ecosim building designer and our new sort of uh, Bentley developer partner network is, is always a, a, a great place for third parties to integrate their analytics. So in this case, you can use partners like Acuity, for example, to do some lighting analysis if necessary. Well, now you got to do the HVAC and piping, right? So what comes with the HVAC and piping are two things, the HVAC inside the building and maybe an energy analysis as well, right? Energy analysis is very big. The first part of it is very simplistic, right? You want to look at the exterior of this particular building. And depending on the geolocation, which we have with our Bentley Map Services, you want to position the sun seven days a week, 365 days around the year, right? And you want to see what kind of solar exposure your building has at different times of the year. So automatically, with our new microstation information modeler in SS3, solar calculations are built in. So you can see how these analytics, which started with things that already existed like civil, are now being enhanced with things like solar analytics. So this is what it's going to look like in December. This is what it will look like in March, in the summertime, and then in the fall again. And that's going to give you a lot of information for you to do an analysis on the inside of the building, right? Because you're not going to pick a heating and air conditioning package unless you know how much help you're going to be getting from the outside, right? So given that, now we can simulate the inside using our new Ecosim Energy Simulator package. Again, based on the same information modeling platform. You haven't ever left that same platform there to do all of these tasks. So we're going to evaluate a packaged VAV system, a central VAV system, a water source heat pump system, and we're going to compare against all of these things to see which one is most beneficial to our particular building. 
So in this particular case, it looks like the water source heat pump seems to be uh, uh, most beneficial. So we did the exterior, we did the interior. Now what happens when you throw an electrical, piping, structural, HVAC, all this stuff together? Something's going to hit something, right? And you're going to have a clash detection. And how are you going to detect this clash? Everybody says, well, I got to go use you know, some other program to get all these people together. But we believe that clash detection should be a fundamental part of your information modeling system. Why does it need to be another program? Well, it can be if you want to aggregate information. Well, we already aggregate information through our iModel technology, right? So in this particular case, it found a clash, a, a, an HVAC uh, uh, duct and went right through that steel beam there, and somebody thought they could play uh, the structural engineer and decided to cut a hole in the beam, right? So that's a pretty good idea. Let's just cut a hole. That thing, everything's going to be good, right? It shouldn't be a problem. Well, the problem is that, you know, that might not work, right? And that structural engineer might not be so happy that uh, his beam was just cut there. But before we go into actually uh, rectifying that problem, let's go over clash detection, why it's important. When you have something like Ecosim Building Designer, where it has clash detection built in, you can coordinate these clashes right away. You know, I, if I normalize the cost of this, it's probably going to be a dollar's worth of work, right? You can then use our Bentley Navigator to take it to a second step. If you need to have a design team coordination session, you want to use Navigator to pull in all this information, that's great as well, right? And that probably costs you a little bit more, right? Because everybody's got to travel, get in the same room, maybe you do it virtually. The last thing you want to do is have something like this and have it clash in the field, right? So you never want to be able to get to that particular point where you're like, whoops, that's just not going to work, right? So big rule of thumb, right? Use the particular products from Bentley to have the clash detection built in so you don't end up doing the $100 work at the end, right? So getting back to this particular structural beam that was cut to uh, facilitate that uh, HVAC pipe going through. I'm now going to use design coordination services, hand it back to the structural engineer. He's going to say, all right, what did you do to my structure? My goodness, it looks like Swiss cheese. I got holes all over the place. I might as well turn those beams into castellated beams there, but I need to make sure, is this going to work? Is this going to pass the local design code checks, right? So he gets all that information, he does his analysis, and as you see there in the yellow, he needs stiffeners, right? Those stiffeners are going to help uh, with the capacity of that particular beam there. So as he designs it, he wants to send back this information. He wants to announce to this world that I've just added stiffeners. The detailer is really going to be interested in that information because he's going to have to fabricate uh, special types of uh, beams now, right? So you'll notice design synchronization services picked up, uh, or the coordination services picked up these new stiffeners. And that information can now be passed on, whether you want to use your iPad or email or whatever it is. We have interoperability to carry that information in a lot of different ways. So now the detailer is going to say, great, you got all this information for me. I got all this right up front, and I can use this right away. You can use our pro structures, uh, again, based on the same platform there, to detail all of his connections, uh, to do all of his footings, his base plates, his rebars, uh, produce a bill of materials. And he can do clash detections. Here you see a very complicated part of the hospital. It's got an embed plate, a lot of connections, a lot of rebar, a lot of congestion. And he can figure out and say, you know what, this is going to be a nightmare in the field. Crews are going to run into each other there. You're going to have to wait for this phase to be done first before this guy goes in there. And so let's resolve all that stuff first. He can also build all of his schedules and bill of materials and produces production drawings using that same information. So if we look at this nice little uh, demonstration here, you see we've taken the connection information that was designed by the structural engineer, brought it into the detailer in here, and he's going to start maybe changing some of the, the way it's cut or formed uh, together there. He's got all the information about our footings. Remember, we designed those footings and the base plates in there, so he's got that information. He can, all, of course, add his own information. Let's say he wants to make a nice little octagonal or a circular base plate there with some shear fins there, so he can add his own information as well. And he has the ability to take existing information, like the footing there, and say, you know what? It's too much congestion. No one can lay rebar like that in the, in the site. I'm going to jog that rebar and shift it over a little bit over there and, uh, and see how that works. And you can send that information back to the engineer if he feels that, you know what? You may have to redesign this because I don't know if this is going to fly or not anymore, right? Shear wall information that came from the structural engineer can also be designed, can also be detailed as well, and quantified. 
because the ultimate goal you want to do is produce that right there, the bar bending schedule. If you can produce the bar bending schedule this early in the process, you are light years ahead of your competition. And in this particular case, he's also doing his fabrication drawings as well. Right? So he's got his documentation produced, and he's starting to produce quantities uh, for the shop and for the, for the shipment. So you have all of these different parts, HVAC, you got you know, electrical, you got all this stuff put together, and that's really what integrated projects you know, is about. But at the end of the day, you want to visualize this, right? I mean, you want to see where you're at uh, in your project. And since this is a hospital, you know it's got to have beds and x-ray machines and uh, you know those, those big scanners, what do you call those, CT scanners and all that stuff. Where do you get this content from, right? It's kind of hard to say, you know, well, you know, I'm going to have to build it using your tools. Well, what Bentley has invested in quite a bit and is going to be launching in 2013 is a new uh, content management system. Okay, with a front-end parametric content modeler that allows you to make your own content, as well as an ability to aggregate existing content that might exist in various different forms today. And this particular service will be linked with all of Bentley's design applications so that content is ubiquitous, right? It, it is agnostic of where it needs to be placed or where it came from. It can be harmonized through any of the applications. So let's look at an example. Okay, so this is a preview of our new parametric content modeler here. And what we want to do for the hospital is we want to create an x-ray viewer, right? Those things where the doctor takes your, the x-ray and sticks it on a thing and turns on a light, right? You can tell I have a medical background, right, with all my lingo. So here we're going to have some constraints between the, the length and the width of the x-ray viewer because we know that it cannot break certain rules or scenarios. You know, there are uh, rules, obviously, in terms of making a hospital there. We also know in terms of the thickness and the weight what the constraints could be. So what's really intelligent is that this is parametric modeling, right? The parametrics are now going to be persisted through the information model. So if you're going to stretch something, it's going to remember what it can stretch or what it can stretch to. So in this particular case, we built this x-ray viewer, and we're ready now to upload it to our Bentley content management system. It's called a Brenner x-ray viewer. It's got some information, some tag information, or so forth. And now we're going to go into back into Ecosim Building Designer. We're going to go into a particular room, an operating room over here, and we're going to launch our content management services, go to the medical equipment site, and we're going to pick that particular x-ray viewer we just made. Now, the information is tied, right? So it knows what to do with it. I can place that particular x-ray viewer on my wall there, and then I can change it. I can either double click on it and change the manufacturer if there's another one I want to use. I can stretch it around and see if I'm violating any laws or any rules that I may have. I can do the same thing for windows and doors. Hospitals, which I didn't know, have specific windows and doors you know, that they may use, right? So here we're going to use a particular content for hospital windows there, and I'm going to place it in there, and right now it's going to be a two-pane window. But, you know, I can stretch it and say, well, what happens if it can't be that big? I need to make it a little bit less in width. Well, it automatically knows you can't sustain a two-pane window in that size anymore from this manufacturer. You've got to go down to one, right? Now, you could produce really good renderings and visualizations, again, in the same information modeler. You don't have to go down to another package, you know, some entertainment system or something like that to produce it. It can all be done within the MicroStation or Ecosim Building Designer product, right? And as you can see here, not only do we get nice little renderings, but we can actually play like the room uh, was going to be used. So using our new effects manager product for our information model, not yet launched, uh, expected to be in 2013, we can actually turn the lights on in the operating room. Here we're turning the lights on on that medical equipment there, changing the intensity there. And our x-ray viewer on the wall that we just put in, we can just turn the lights on on that, change the intensity of that as well. Now, what's really great about these things is that you, as a surgeon, may say, well, if there's too much reflection or refraction of that, you know, that's going to bother me, right? I don't want to be cutting somebody open and bang, the x-ray turns on and, you know, bad things happen, right, after that, right? So all that stuff can be simulated. So we believe a simulation of not just being analysis but working in production of how the actual building looks. And at the end of the day, as Bob was showing, with all of this new content now included in our MicroStation information modeler, you can produce a really, really cool 3D visualization fly-through of the particular hospital that you have. And this is great.
need for not only investigation, but you know, bidding purposes and, and visualization, right? So we went all the way from that dirt in the ground to this beautiful little 3D structure without leaving our environment. That's pretty good stuff uh, that Bentley can provide, right? But at the end of the day, unfortunately, we get paid for drawings, right? Got to produce records. And as of today, 3D models is one way to share, it, but it's not the uh, it's not the uh, the totally accepted way. So, but people, how do they say building information models or information models and 2D drawings? How do they sort of kind of coexist with each other? And what we did is we patented a new technology called hypermodeling that allows you to blend 2D models, 2D drawings, or 2D entities with a 3D model. So you can see over here in this particular hospital, I'm in a 3D model mode, and I've produced a dynamic callout that allows me to overlay the 2D drawing on that particular cut, right? So I can actually see that normal extraction that you have, right? You know, maybe you've used uh, dynamic views or dynamic extraction manager to produce these plan drawings are now superimposed on the 3D model. So you can kind of see how we've done that throughout the building that we have, right? Really good way to put these drawing sheets on your 3D model. Now it doesn't stop there, right? It doesn't have to be just 2D drawings, right? In this particular example of the hospital, I can actually link a, 3D, a 2D specification of a PDF onto that cut as well, right? So Greg talked about our new specifications acquisition that we had, and we can take the output of that and also link that. Or construction photos that you may have. As you're building it, you may want to take a photo and link that at the particular cross-section or the point in the building that it's being created. So by tagging this information on the 3D model, that's what we call hyper-modeling. You're extending really the reach of your normal, of your normal model, right? So in summary that we have over here, right, we talked about interoperability, right, that big interoperability mess, right, that was the problem that a lot of people had today, exchanging information, using project-wise coordination services, we're allowed to exchange this information, you know, within the same information model. We talked about how we can produce dynamic documentation, and we talked about how simulation and visualization of our particular products, you know, doesn't stop at just structures or energy, it kind of has uh, the whole uh, flavor to it. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at, well, you know, Sintan, you said you talked about energy, you talked about structural, you talk about all these different analytics, but how do they all play with each other, right? If you really think about it, if I change the site of the building that I have over here, right, that sun's position on that building is going to completely change, right? It's going to change everything. Cut and fill is going to change. The wind direction is going to change, which is going to update your structural uh, problem or your structural uh, analysis there. So the problems that we have today is that people really want to do a deeper dive investigation of their model, but they really just don't have the resources or the time to create this model. I mean, if you think about it, is the bracing configuration in this particular building, assuming it's a steel building, which it's not, but let's say it was, you know, do you think that that's actually optimal? Do you actually think you use the optimal sections? Do you really think you have the right thickness of the slab there? You don't know. And at the end of the day, you can't possibly know because you don't have time to make 9 million models to check every single one and then compare them, right? But what happens if there was an ability to do that? right? And the other problem is you don't have the resources, right? I only got one computer, maybe two, maybe it's multi-core, maybe it has four processors, you know, but still all those models, very hard to do. And I'm not getting paid to do that, right? Or any more money to do that. So how can we at Bentley help you uh, uh, with that goal? Well, everybody started out with conceptual modeling. That was great. Then they started getting a parametric modeling. That's great. What I kind of contend is that you must build computational design with your information model. Your information model is not intelligent infrastructure unless it understands its analytics. Impossible. Cannot happen, right? It's just a funny shape, geometry, geometric model, right? So if you kind of go through this, this is the traditional way everybody does design alternatives today. Come up with your model, Try a design, you don't like it, see what it says, go back, change your design. Do it two or three times, because at the end of the day, how much time do you have to be able to do that? And do that in series, meaning the structural engineer handles his part, the energy guy handles his part, the, you know, the acoustic guy will handle his part. Nobody talks to each other. Nobody shares that inf information. So what we're introducing is, well, what happens if we gave you an infrastructure, right? So a set of services. Uh, that leverages uh, cloud, and it also leverages the fact that you don't have to change your workflow, 
right? Because the last thing somebody wants to do is, hey, we can give you all this stuff, but you have to change everything. And we allow you a tool to, or to evaluate all of these scenarios, right? I mean, if you had something like that, which we call optioneering, that might be a way for you to transcend from this iterative design or single design to kind of this particular schema, right? Where we say, go ahead and simulate all the different options that you may have in there to you know, design all of them, right? Gather all that information together and present it in a way that I can make a choice. There is no such thing as the design, right? The optimal design, right? There's too many factors, right? You cannot optimize on 80 variables, right? It's mathematically impossible, right? So it's not like it's the lowest way to steal, lowest energy, lowest cut and fill, low, it, it can't be, right? I mean, you could, I guess, get lucky, but chances are it can't. So the trade-off is something you must make as a decision. What are you willing to live with? Where is the ROI most important for you? And there's a lot of simulations. If you look at this hospital alone, look at, go around and read around this particular circle. Those are all types of analysis you're going to have to contend with. Fire, right? Structural, foundation, heat gain, shading, daylight distribution, right to light. Everything is affected based on the materials you use, where you position the building, and so forth, right? So you can see in this particular example that we have here, a lot of these things are going to influence how we're going to actually design this hospital. So as I said before, you won't know if your design is optimal. At the end of the day, what Bentley's new simulation services are going to do is provide you choices, right? It's going to say, I'm not going to evaluate 5 million models. I know how to evaluate 50 of them, which are probably going to be the 50 you want to take a look at. And then I can graph them so you can kind of see how they compare against each other. And we're going to take a look at how this works live, right? So what type of analysis are we already bringing to you? Well, we have solar analysis. We can do some intersection analysis or shadowing analysis there. And we're working on a whole bunch, right? The ones in green we already have. The ones in yellow we're working on, like duct sizing and lead certification and site. And of course, the ones in red, like fire blast or sprinkler layout or egress or all types of simulation engines we're trying to provide for you as a service. And it's not limited to a product. You're an ecosim building designer fine. You're an open plant, great. You're in another third-party application and you want access to it, no problem. Well, you're going to say, well, how do you do that? How do you aggregate information, you know, being agnostic as to where it's coming from? Well, that's where iModels come in. Remember, Bupinder and Greg were talking about it's an aggregation format, right? We don't really care. We have a way to suck in that information, aggregate it, break it down into its essentials such that our engines can take advantage of that data, right? Powerful, powerful stuff. So the cloud, right? And you guys have probably heard about the cloud everywhere, right? Everybody talks about it and says, that's great. And you know, we, we put, well, actually, we have to put quotes around that because we believe there is no such thing as the cloud, right? Lots of different clouds, right? And at the end of the day, everybody knows what it's used for. It's used for power, scalability, and uh, obviously, uh, storage would be a simple requirement as well. And there's a lot of security issues and things like that that we have to play with. But people have been using for quite some time. If, if you have Fortune 500 company using Salesforce.com to manage, you know, two, whatever, $100 billion worth of revenue, I'm sure, you know, your engineering data is also probably going to be pretty secure as well, right? So let's look at two really distinct examples. And this is where we're going to get a bit interactive, right? Uh, but we're going to start off with the first one, calling the offshore wind turbine. We're in, we're in Europe. It's really great, right? Everybody's green conscious here. America's supposed to be now that we elected our president, who's also supposed to get us on the green track. I'm excited about that. Not really. But you know, the offshore wind turbine that we have there, we have two parts. We got the, the pylon on the front, and we got the jacket on the bottom there. And the key to this is the connection, right? And you can see the connection there. That connection has to be stable. If that connection goes, that structure goes, right? And that's bad. And these are put out in the middle of the, not in the middle of the ocean, but in ocean depths. So your number one problem is the wave loads, right? You could have waves hit it and pound it due to a storm. You could have a ship accidentally bump into it, you know, as well. And it's going to be fatigued, right? It's constantly being battered all the time. And the problem is, how do you figure out how much steel you need or how much welding you need to reinforce that, right? At the end of the day, every extra centimeter, which is not much, of steel weld uh, for this particular uh, offshore wind turbine costs about $400,000 in material cost and costs another $450,000 in construction cost. A million bucks, right? But at the end of the day, 
you know, you can't have this thing collapse. So the average steel thickness is about 25 centimeters for something like this, right? So we partner with Microsoft and Windows Azure is our cloud provider, our SaaS provider, you know, to help, to help us run and manage these simulations here. And you can see for this particular wind turbine, and I'm just going to go through this example really quick, you have almost six or 700 different types of time histories or what we call wave loading patterns that are going to hit that particular uh, turbine there, right? So it could be based on the different seasons of the year, right? The waves change. It could be the salinity of the water makes the water heavier on impact. It could be marine biology as well. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you have plankton or algae in different parts of the season there, when that wave carries that, right, you would think like it's not a lot of weight, but it's a ton of weight, you know, and when that repeatedly hits your offshore structure, that adds something. You do that, each one of those particular simulations takes two to three hours. So you've got 700 of them. You multiply those together, it's going to take you 88 days, days, to analyze that particular offshore wind turbine. You're going to say, well, that's, no, you're not going to do that, right? I'm going to put this on a supercomputer, buy a lot of cores. Well, how many cores are you going to get? Eight. So 88 divided by eight might be 11 uh, days to do that. Well, you're going to say, well, I'm not going to do that either. Well, what else are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to use experience, right? Well, 25 centimeters seemed to work for the guy that built it in the 70s. Guess it's got to work today, right? And at the end of the day, you got to do this for 100 wind turbines. And everyone says, well, Centennial, that's just control C, control V, copy, paste, easy, right? It's not, because if you notice, the water depth is not constant, right? It's not like a piece of land where they grade it. You can't grade the bottom of the ocean floor. And the other thing is that you got waves and wind that hit these things a different direction. If you're a human standing in front of me, and you know the wind's going to block you, right? And so I'm not going to take as much of the wind. So all of these calculations change. So how do you go through all of these permutations? Well. What we've done is we've put our SACS product, which Greg talked about, our newly acquired offshore, makes Bentley the number one provider of offshore uh, simulation products, onto our new Bentley simulation services uh, with the help of Microsoft, of course. And you can see here that that one node that took 88 days, now with 300 nodes, because we can scale on the cloud, takes seven hours to run one. But guess what? You can run a hundred of them in the same seven hours. Why? Because you can run a hundred, three hundred nodes, clusters at one time. So you're now solving a very complex problem in seven hours and you can see the pricing difference uh, between having an engineer do that work and having the cloud service, simulation services do that work as well. Now, how much does that save you? Well, once you get the simulation, this was done using our simulation services. It was down, downloaded back onto the SACS product, so that's what we we're visualizing over here. You'll notice that after all those runs, it tells us that around seven centimeters, it's not going to change the fatigue life of my offshore structure. So the other 18 centimeters that I'm slapping on it is doing absolutely nothing. It's not helping me at all except costing me money. Right? And that really would not have been done without this simulation. Now you would say, well, this is fairy tale. Well, it's really not. Lloyd's Register was the one that actually provided us with this model and did this simulation with us. And this is a quote from one of their leading offshore engineers that said how this particular system we built was revolutionary and it's going to save and really revolutionize the, the industry, right? Because you can do problems that you could never do uh, before. So powerful stuff. Now, we're going to optimize a steel frame building in here, and this is where we're going to have a little interactive uh, thing. And I have Bob Mankowski as my helper in case you guys need some help. Um, but what we're going to try to do is you guys logged into a site, right? So I'm going to try to interactively walk you through simulation services. You can use your laptop, your iPad. iPhone might be a little tough, small display, but, you know, you guys are probably used to it anyway. So how does it all work? You know, well, let's take a, a very quick example here. Um, I have this particular model, and I'm going to start with a very easy model over here. And uh, this particular model, I'm going to create a whole bunch of scenarios, 10, 20, 50 scenarios. I don't know how to optimize this particular frame, right? I don't know what is the, the type of uh, bracing pattern or the type of material or the, the type of cross sections that I need over here. Well, as you'll notice in all of our simulation services or all of our analytical product, we all have simula simulation service uh, menus now. 
that allow us to log into this, uh, this cloud, uh, simulation cloud services that we have, right? And what it allows us to do is it allows to post these projects and manage them um, on, uh, our, on our uh, particular uh, cloud services there. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna mess around with this project and I'm just gonna simply add in a beam from let's say here to here and I'm gonna let's say make it you know a particular uh, uh, you know cross-sectional property over here so let's say I'm just gonna assign that there okay and now what I want to basically do is obviously save this model and I now want to post this model up to the cloud or our cloud services right now it's gonna say well you gotta make a scenario right so I have a be inspired project this is where I'm going to hold all my scenarios that are related to this particular project here and I'm gonna create a new scenario and I'm gonna call it scenario you know 55 or something and basically we added um, some beams uh, to the east end over there right so I'm going to say OK to this. And what it's going to do, it's going to communicate with our cloud services. It's going to create this particular scenario. And then I'm going to submit a job. And it's going to say, OK, go ahead and run. And after that, I can continue to work. I can continue to say, OK, right, I can do whatever I want. I can continue to change the model or update the model or whatever it may be there. And, uh, and I can uh, then start comparing. So as this is going to run over here, as this is going to create this scenario, uh, we're going to say OK and submit this job. Now it's communicating. I'm now gonna ask you guys to go to the site, okay? So here's the website, and you guys should see this once you log in. Does everybody see this? Anybody that is interactive? You'll get two projects. You'll get a One Tree Hill building, and you'll get a Be Inspired. If you can't figure it out, it's just like high school. Look at your neighbors and copy him, right? Or whoever, there's always one person in the row that knows what they're doing, just copy him, right? What's that? A Bentley test? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the Be Inspired uh, one here, right? And it might take a little bit of uh, uh, time uh, to load in. And I don't know if this particular uh, project is done. It's not, uh... is everybody clicking on that? Oh, you didn't, you didn't have that shared file. I haven't shared that one to you. Okay, well, so you have the One Tree Hill building? Okay. That, that's a good one there. And a project called Bentley Test. Okay, that's fine. So you can just follow along with me. I, I apologize for that one. I didn't share it. So we just created this scenario called 55, right? And I have a whole bunch of other scenarios. So this one we said we added some beams to the east, adding some bracings on the north end. Well, let's compare a couple of these together, right? So let's compare this one with the original one over here. And I'm going to come in here and say, you know what? Let's compare my scenarios, right? I'm doing this all using our cloud uh, services that we have. It's aggregating all the data together and it's gonna uh, plot them. And you can see that I can now look at what my costs are for these particular three scenarios that I had. Some of them have beams that are on the east and west end. Some of them, you know, have changed material properties and so forth and so on. And uh, what's my overall utilization index? Now, what does that mean? That means that the higher this particular number is, the better it is for me, right? Because I'm maximizing the use of the materials or the steel that I have in my particular uh, structure. Um, I can change my costs, for example, here. So I can come down here and I can edit my cost function, right? So if I come over here and just edit this, I can say, you know what? I can come up with a way to calculate the cost for my building. You can create what other type of cost you want. Let's say I'm gonna multiply this by four because I'm dealing with uh, some people that are, uh, kind of ripping me off there and you can see your costs are automatically updating over there you can also compare by other types of scenarios so you can say I'm sorry they can do this with the one tree hill you can do this with the one tree hill sorry, absolutely right you go ahead and click into that and they can compare just to make sure absolutely right so we can actually just jump in there if you guys want to follow along with me it's the same it's the same thing really so if everybody kind of goes back there and uh, finds the one tree hill. So I'm gonna go back into my projects uh, setting there. And you had two, you had the test one, which I apologize, I should have shared that one. And you had the one tree hill one there. So you can click on the one tree hill one. You can then go into there and start picking some scenarios. Why don't you guys pick all of the scenarios? For example, if you wanna click that little checkbox on the top there, you can click all of the scenarios, 
go down to the bottom and hit that compare button and you'll be able to see the same thing uh, that I did, right? So does everybody see that? Everybody have their scenarios listed on there? You should see something like this popping up. Should have about 15 scenarios. Okay, and what you can do is just click this little button right on the top because I want to compare all 15 of my scenarios or whatever it may be and then click the compare button at the bottom there. Does everybody see that? Yeah? If you don't, we have our uh, teaching assistant here, Bob Mankowski. He's, he's tough. Huh? Masters County. Masters County. Masters County. Masters County. Masters County. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Slave labor. Exactly, <laughs> slave labor. So you can see here, I'm comparing a lot of these scenarios. Now, if I go back into my particular PowerPoint presentation here, you'll see what the types of scenarios I'm actually comparing against here. So I'll look at this particular example, and uh, oh, actually has the knee bracings and the knife bracings in there. Actually, I don't have it in there. But if I go over here, you'll notice that these have uh, X bracings, these have knife or chevron bracings. Some are hollow sections, some are uh, channel sections that you have on there. And you can see, I can compare, well, how is my overall utilization index in there? Or if you guys want to, you can check on your weight by material type, right? So you can see for all the different scenarios, which ones are carrying the most weight, how much steel are you using on each one? And you can see here, the cost of those particular materials on the right hand side, right? So to it allows you to easily evaluate which one is actually a better option you know, for me. And if you guys want to mess around with your cost function, you can come right down here and right above your table, you can click on this edit cost function and you can type in something else. I mean, you won't know some of these units and things like that. So you can just maybe say times five or something like that, right? Uh, just for simplicity's sake, right? But we are now using, maybe this is the first time you guys are using for official uh, simulation cloud services to help evaluate multiple design scenarios, okay? So I want to end it there on that particular note, and I want to pass it over now to Ken Adamson, who is going to talk about how to use design interoperability or interoperability services with a plant structure. Okay, so thank you. I'm going to talk about the importance of interoperability and picking up on the themes from earlier today. And we're going to go through a, uh, a plant design um, a modeling uh, a process here. So um, why is interoperability important between the different disciplines? Well, I mean, not to be too dr melodramatic here, but uh, despite our best efforts, we do get catastrophic failures that occur in plants. Often they can be a result of poor communication which uh, can be exacerbated by last minute changes that you make into your design. And when you were relying on manual methods or manual processes to hand over that information, we get you know, un unintended, possible unintended consequences of that. So in our little example today, we're gonna take um, a plant structure from the structural design department. We're gonna combine it with our, a piping model or piping design, as well as with an equipment model. And we're gonna look at this scenario uh, and kind of go through a, a little, mimic a little bit of a design scenario here. Now, what applications would we expect to participate in collaboration? Well, there's probably a lot many, many more than you would anticipate. From modeling the equipment, the piping, and the buildings, to the analysis, uh, which can range from the structural analysis to foundations, to the connections, to the pipe stress, and it can be from both Bentley as well as third parties such as Tecla or Revit. And so how do we have to solve this problem? Well, we want to leverage uh, at its core this project-wise cross-discipline coordination services, which helps define a common expression, a common language to communicate information between those different diverse applications and provide some standard tools to visualize and highlight those changes and provide the revision management uh, across this process. So uh, to help us uh, kind of get move along, we've got a little... Uh, uh, orange boxes here which we're going to orientate around based on what uh, particular application we're using and kind of help you uh, uh, follow along and we're using these uh, cross-discipline coordination services to communicate between these different applications. So we're going to start off with uh, uh, pro structures and pro structures uh, is used by a steel designer and it works with both steel and concrete uh, uh, designs. Uh, which is perfect actually for this plant model because we've got to deal with foundations as well as the structure itself. And we provide uh, automatic drawing capabilities and extraction capabilities as well as the clash detection where we can now do clash detection 
actually between the walls and the concrete footings themselves in terms of those embedments, etc., what we saw uh, in some of the earlier examples. And we're also going to look at uh, some of the other te modeling techniques that we can use, including details for, such as handrails, but also using dynamic views. We can use dynamic views that we saw earlier from Centano to actually create our actual production documents uh, uh, for the, the structural designer. So let's look at our first little uh, vignette here. And we'll look at pro structures in action for the plant model. And we'll, um, we're going to load up a steel model, which actually includes already all our structural design. Now, we don't want to communicate everything uh, for analysis. There's certain things that are really of no interest to the other disciplines, such as you know the stairway or a catwalk is not particularly interesting. So we want to fil filter those out and just send over through the cross-discipline uh, coordination services just the exchange model we, we, want to, we want to communicate. So you have control over what you're communi communicating. And we can use uh, or, or, uh, the, the material assignments. We can do the material assignments on this structure before we send it over. And in, uh, uh, in the course uh, cross-discipline coordination services, we can highlight the changes. So that we're going to see this repeatedly, where we're basically seeing what we've, uh, what we've submitted in for, for communicating. And at the moment, everything is new. Everything has changed. And that's what we're, what, that's what we're uh, using here. So having established the structure, I want to take the structure information and bring it into uh, my plant. Now we're using open plant in this case. Open plant is our uh, component driven uh, multi-user plant modeling environment based on the ISO 15926 standard. And some of the new things we've also added in here inside uh, open plant is the ability to compare both your 2D design to your 3D design. So an important aspect for 3D design is also to compare between, say, the PID done by the process engineer and the 3D model done uh, that we're trying to, to lay out here. And we have a new uh, comparison capability to compare your PNIDs with 3D models and also highlight changes made or differences between the PID and the 3D uh, design. So we can also look at comparing those uh, through, through this uh, same technology. <coughs> But we're, going to get, we're getting away from what we're trying to show here. We're trying to show the piping. So part of the piping is to also deal with uh, the piping attachments to the steel. So we're going to use some kind of support systems, whether they're clamps, guys, or shoes. But more often than not, uh, you're going to want to create actually assemblies to support your piping structures, which can be fairly complex in themselves. And uh, in Open Plant, what we're working on for 2013 is actually a whole new capability for modeling, detailing uh, uh, pipe support assemblies uh, and being able to analyze and generate the documents required for those piping support assemblies. So in this, uh, uh, we're going to take that model we saw from the structure, and we've got our piping model. We've already done a little bit of work ahead of time. And we're going to zoom in, and we're going to look at this pipe, and we've attached it to the structure using a particular uh, pipe support. So we can go and analyze exactly what we defined, what type of support system we're using here. And I want to pass this, my piping information, over to a uh, pipe stress engineer for actually to do some calculations on the pipe stress. And I could select individual components, or I can just say I'm going to send all, over all my piping. Uh, and at the same time, I'm going to, I'm going to help the, uh, the, the stress engineer out by providing him some initial starting conditions uh, for, for what uh, I want to communicate. So again, I'm going to publish this out to our design synchronization uh, uh, services to help you to help communicate to the uh, the piping uh, uh, stress engineer. So from uh, from Open Plant, we're going to go into AutoPipe, and AutoPipe is our stress analysis application. It supports class one, class two, and class three piping designs, and it also provides a unique way to communicate in two ways to our structural analysis pro steel. So in AutoPipe, uh, it is a leading, generate, uh, leading uh, application for doing stress analysis. It has the latest seismic and, and wind codes uh, supported. We can manage multiple different structures. So if a pipe goes across multiple structures, we can analyze how that behaves between structures. And we also model underground piping. So if, you, you're, if you're doing subsurface uh, pipes, we saw uh, uh, Bob talking about some subsurface pipes earlier. We can also analyze subsurface pipes and how they come into the ground and go out of, out of the ground. Very important for doing, when you're doing your piping analysis to also look at what happens when you're interacting with uh, uh, the ground. 
In addition to that, uh, we have uh, what we call hot uh, clash detection as well as cold clash detection. So normally when you're doing a clash detection, you're looking at the static situation of an existing pipe. You're not really considering what happens when the pipe is actually full of liquid or gas or whatever it is under operating conditions. And we can actually see and, and you can get uh, clashes because of uh, uh, the actual operations of the pipe and we can highlight and, and detect when those clashes occur. So let's look at uh, uh, this, uh, the stress engineer inside Autopipe. He's going to load his, uh, his piping model information from uh, uh, OpenPlant. And we're going to look at the particular support system. So we can run uh, the initial stress analysis. We can use those load cases passed over from OpenPlant. Uh, and we can add some additional loads, such as seismic loads or wind loads uh, in there. And we can, do, and we can run their, their cases. So we can easily identify where there's overstress situations in the pipe. Uh, so we might need to go modify that pipe, add some additional uh, supports in there uh, to take care of that. But one of the things we want to do is actually attach the pipe to the structure because one of the, uh, the, the important aspects is how do we pass those pipe stresses onto the structure and to make sure the structural sizes of the uh, beams, etc., that are used are suitably sized to deal with um, to deal with the, uh, uh, those additional loads. So, before we're talking about STAD, let's do, do a quick recap. So we started in ProStructure as we designed, we decide, defined the structural frame, we passed it over to OpenPlant, we rooted some pipe, we've passed it on to the pipe stress analysis guide to do some uh, uh, analysis on your piping, and now we've got to the structural. So, in STAD, um, STAD is our uh, 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 leading application for uh, structural analysis. It provides uh, uh, structural analysis and design. It has over 100 codes built in as part of as part of STAD for, uh, across uh, across the world. We've also have STAD advanced uh, uh, foundation advanced application as well as RAM connections integrated in here for how how we deal with the integrated steel structure. We've also got more dynamic and analysis capabilities in STAD than ever with new output and visualization capabilities. Uh, together with uh, some of these cloud services that we've just uh, been, been talking about and you've just been trying out as well and how to use that as part of our, uh, uh, a work process and to deal with large models and how to move them off, offload them from your desktop and, and put them onto a cloud service uh, as part of your work process. So we're going to take that structural model and the piping information together and we're going to use our cross-discipline application services to, to, to analyze this. But first of all, we need to attach the, the structure to the ground, so we're going to put in some, some structural uh, base supports in here. We've got to attach them on the piping load so we can see the pipe and structure together, not just in, in one, and, and do the calculations based on the combination of the, those. So as we're doing this, we might find there's some undersized beams which we have to highlight and change and make modifications for, uh, uh, et cetera. So we can make those modifications. At the same time, we can go into RAM and do the RAM connection analysis and look at and decide how we're going to connect those, steels, those steel connections uh, and make them together and be able to, and be able to select particular uh, connection types. In this case, we're going to use a bolted connection, and we can actually see the details of the bolted connection directly within the application, and we can generate all the documents we require for that, uh, uh, for that connection detail uh, that we see here. So this is uh, uh, a detailed set of connections that have been set, and we want to show those highlights, highlights the changes back into our uh, 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 detailer here, we can actually see the difference of what we've changed and we can accept those changes before moving further on. So we've taken some information in, we've made some modifications because of the stress information and we're passing it back out to our uh, design synchronization services to highlight what you've changed. So next we're going to look at the foundations that we just talked about. So in Stand Foundation Advance, it provides uh, non-finite element based uh, design of your footings. Uh, um, sorry, Stad Pro provides non-standard, uh, non-finite element, element based. In Stad Advanced, you can use finite anal analysis techniques to to size your footings here. And it is a special purpose tool specifically for uh, these designs, and it, can, it includes many uh, dozens of different design codes itself. It provides automatic meshing, uh, which you need for finite anal element analysis. And it provides uh, interoperability with things like Excel, so if you want to, to, to do some work and, and provide some input through Excel. 
It uses the latest ACI concrete codes, uh, provides comprehensive do uh, documentation for your required. It deals with, um, and well, soon you're going to get cyclical loading. So if you've got pumps or any rotating equipment and you want to see how those rotational forces get transmitted into the foundations, you can also use it for transmitting those rotational forces. So it's very, a specialized tool, but required in, in many instances based on the types of equipment that you're using. So in this uh, uh, example, we're going to take those uh, initial uh, foundations that we created in, in STAD, and we can actually uh, to do a more detailed work on it. Now, as part of this uh, detailed look, uh, work, we can isolate the particular footings, define a particular defined uh, footing design here with some comprehensive output and, and generation. We can also attach footings together. So we want to create a combined footing wizard. Uh, we can do that and look at their detailed designs that we get from the footing. We also have a specific utility for dealing with foundations for vessels. So you can look at a vessel design, generate those loads for a vessel, and, and create a, a custom footing design uh, for a vessel. Again, all these changes we can communicate back out through a cross-discipline coordination services. This time you see our footings being added into the same combined model. We're going to use that information uh, 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 as well in our, in our next step. So we heard Greg talk about uh, Microportal, one of our latest acquisitions for vessel design. So even for the vessel design, I can look at the vessel design conditions, I can place my nozzles, I can determine and look at uh, my, nozzle, uh, my vessel interiors as part of this application. Again, these are all detailed calculations required for sizing and, and specifying your vessel. Uh, you can do, uh, you can generate the output documents required for your vessel, including all the background uh, calculations that are used to determine wall thickness, etc., and generate your detailed documents uh, all through uh, the Microportal acquisition. So, fits very nicely in with uh, everything else that we're doing here. So. Uh, so far, all we've done is we've gone from one discipline to the next. But the biggest challenge, and I think the biggest problem that anybody has is, well, you've got to go backwards too. It's, a, it's an interactive loop here. It's not just a one-way workflow we've got to deal with. We want to go backwards as well as forwards. So once I've done my structure, maybe I've got to go back into my piping analysis and reanalyze what I've just done and what impact that might have and whether I've actually solved the problem. So I need to go take those changes we've made and push them back into uh, a prior step. So let's look at uh, uh, what would have happened in, in autopipe with the, the stress analysis given these changes, given the structures that I've used. So I've got, I've got my structure and my piping combined through the cross-discipline uh, services here. I can look, I've still got some problems I've got to solve. So this is an iterative process. We're going to go through and we're going to solve it until we've resolved these particular issues. But we can also look at uh, other conditions we talked about before. I can simulate, now that I have my piping and structure together, I can look at the difference of what I'm going to have with my hot and cold clashes. So I can detect maybe other issues beyond simply the, the structure um, and the an analysis here to see what else is going to happen when it's actually in operations, when things move within operations, and be able to make those adjustments as well. So. Final step, let's go back to where we started and go back to uh, Pro Structures and the structural engineer. He's got to make his updates too. So we can go into the original structure, my, uh, my structural engineer, and I can load in all the changes that have been made through a cross-discipline application services and highlight the changes and accept or reject the particular changes I want to bring in. So this is a composite of everything that's happened since I first pushed it out. <clears throat> I can see my footings in here. Um, uh, as well as the additional bracings I have. I can now attach in my original information. Remember I threw away that information I didn't want to communicate? Well, I can bring that back in and see my combination of my total structural design. I can also make further changes. So we did the footings for, for this particular vessel. I might want to put some bending uh, 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 hook points, hook bars in for the concrete. I can make those hook bar adjustments directly uh, within this application too. And of course, I could communicate those back out. And I can generate my bar bending schedules as well as my detailed design documents that you would expect the user to, to make from within uh, Pro Structures with all the detailed dimensions uh, for fabrication. So bit of a whirlwind tour through uh, a particular application, but we're kind of not done yet, which is let's look at uh, uh, the mobility in the field. How do we get this out into a, a, a construction environment where they can also share in this information?
And I think this is one of the areas. We saw these uh, demos earlier today, uh, and I think these are, these are great. Uh, we can take a full plant model uh, using our uh, Bentley, Na Bentley Navigator on the iPad, for example, and we can walk through uh, our total design. I can do some fun little things, like I can measure dimensions myself. And what you're going to see soon is, is the ability to do those markups uh, uh, and changes in here. And so I can make a markup and a comment and feed those markups and comments back to those discipline engineers working in my office as to what changes they might make, need to make to deal with my uh, 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 site conditions. So uh, pretty compelling interface, uh, uh, very exciting uh, uh, you know, new possibilities of how we integrate in uh, the construction field guys back into my design process and make sure I'm getting their feedback back into my design. Okay, so uh, we're kind of done here. As I said, it's a bit of a whirlwind tour <laughs> for everybody today. Hopefully you can keep up and, uh, and, and I think we've been told we've yeah, hit the limit. <laughs> so I apologize for that. It's yeah. their fault. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I think this is one of the advantages of our cross-discipline uh, coordination services is the effective change management or precise, the precise information we're passing back and forward provided together with the, visu the realistic visualization and the re reliability and persistence of the revision history, allowing you to, to choose which information you need and when you need it for uh, no matter what your application. <coughs> so thanks very much, and um, you guys we're have out any of questions? Here. I know we're, uh, we have uh, the, we ran over time. Here. Yeah, there's some uh, oh, no round tables that are going on, but if you guys have any questions, we'd be happy to answer some for you here. And if not, we are uh, around here for the next couple hours. Could uh, answer them in the hallway as well. Yes, sir. Sure. Um, Yep, laser scanning. Um, so is there a uh, feature extraction in the geometry, given that you're probably bringing other kinds of data, so can you match that up with the No, it's at my Yes, you can. Yeah. So um, there's a good analogy. If you remember, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, getting a lot of raster data and then trying to do some raster to vector conversion, right? We all remember going through that. Well, it's very similar with point clouds, except it's now 3D raster, if you will, 3D data. And so converting that to a vector geometry is also possible, right? So being able to look at the, uh, the point cloud and extract a linear feature, or say you've um, uh, scanned a highway and you want to find the the brake line along the curb or the, the median uh, structure, you know, what they call a Jersey barrier back in the States, right? So we can do those types of feature extractions and we use our product as Descartes is, is basically the product that we're embedding all these feature extraction capabilities into. So yes, it's a, it's a great workflow um, and we're providing a lot of tools in that area. But I do want to stress that the 3D model of a point cloud is a model itself and can be used for things like clash detection and some of the, that's one of the things we've been working on. So you don't necessarily have to create a vector model out of the point cloud in order to do some really interesting things with it. It's not just for visualization. You can use it for clash detection. You can use it for lots of things. All right, thanks Jeff, good question. Any other questions? I apologize for running long. If not, thank you very much for your attention.